What do Caribbean islands, Ethiopian churches and Bob Marley all have in common? We've all heard of Rastafarians, but how many of us actually know what they believe? Now Rastafarianism is actually one of the Abrahamic religions, alongside Islam, Christianity and Judaism to name the three large ones in the group. They can all be broken down into their respective divisions and sects. The Rastafari belief set draws mostly from Christian teachings and scriptures, although it's quite a traditionalist, literalist reading of the scriptures, so it does have certain features more in common with Judaism as well. Ja is a very important term and is the Rastafari word for God. It is actually a shortening of Jehovah, which is one of the names of God in Hebrew. Rastology is this particular Rastafari interpretation of the Bible, which is quite traditionalist and literalist. For example, most Rastafari people, or Rastas as they are shortly known as, do not eat pork because it's forbidden in Leviticus, as well as then wearing dreadlocks, which are very famous because it says in Leviticus not to take the knife to the skin, etc. And this Rastology also is often interpreted by these people as meaning that black people were the chosen race of God, the chosen people and one of the tribes of Israel. Liberty is another word that is used, and it's the Rastafari way of life. Now, often they try to live naturally in a most um, natural way possible, often going back to patriarchal structures of society, as well as then wearing the dreadlocks and not following certain societal conformities. Now, this all goes back to a man named Marcus Garvey, who was a big inspiration for the Rastafari movement. He was a Pan-Africanist and also believed that Africans should feel more empowered in the modern world. And it's thanks to his teachings coming to Jamaica in the 1930s that the descendants of slaves started to form what would become the Rastafari movement. The Ethiopianist movement was a movement that also very much influenced the Rastafaris who would go on to take this idea much further and was essentially that black churches often felt that they were too much under the control of white people at the time. And so they looked to Ethiopia, where there was an Ethiopian Orthodox church that had been run by black people for millennia, and they tried to emulate this. This was on top of also Pan-African ideas, which were seeking the empowerment and further civil rights for black people and the African diaspora as a whole. This was often met with this idea of repatriation to Africa, of sending black people who were in the Caribbean and North America as well as other parts of the world and who had been taken there as slaves to send their descendants back to Africa as some kind of promised land. And this is where another term used in Rastafari circles, Zion, comes from. This is the promised land of Africa. Zion actually originally means Jerusalem, but in the Rastafari context it's used for Africa, although sometimes more specifically as Ethiopia specifically. As well, Babylon is then the obverse of Zion. Babylon in the Bible, of course, is where the Jews are sent in exile as slaves under the Babylonians. And so Babylon, in a Rastafari context, are the oppressive Western lands where they believe black people are being oppressed and that they should return to Africa, their promised land. Um, especially Ethiopia as well. Now there's a reason that Ethiopia has such a prominent position in all of this and for Rastafaris and I will explain why. Now again it goes back to Marcus Garvey because he said in 1920, look to Africa when a black king shall be crowned for the day of deliverance is at hand. And just a decade later when a man named Haile Selassie became the emperor of Ethiopia, many Africans believed that this prophecy had indeed come true. Now, within five years, the Italians had invaded Haile Selassie's Ethiopian Empire in the Second Italo-Ethiopian War. And although they fought bravely, eventually the Ethiopians, using largely spears and swords against the Italians' tanks and heavy machine guns, were defeated after a bitter struggle. However, Haile Selassie and the British would return in 1941 during the North Africa campaigns of the Second World War, and together they were able to defeat the Italian colonizers there, and he was able to reclaim the Ethiopian throne. Now all of this and especially the Time Magazine's articles of his coronation all reached Jamaica and people there really believed that this man, the man prophesied by Marcus Garvey to come, was a sign that times were changing for them. And this is why Haile Selassie gets such a prominent position in the Rastafari movement. And actually the very name Rastafari 
isn't actually the name of the movement. Originally, it was the name of Haile Selassie because Ras is the Ethiopian word for the kind of lord or head and he was known as Tafari Makonnen. So his name is actually now the name of the movement that came to worship him in that form. Now actually, just after this, many people in Jamaica who associated with the Rasta movement tried to seize the towns of Kingston and Spanish Town and add it to this new Ethiopian empire, thinking that the time had come for them. However, these were violently put down by the authorities at the time. However, when Jamaica became independent in 1959, it's 1962. Thanks, future Hilbert. Well, it's really past Hilbert now, isn't it, to be honest? Because I've already said it, so it's not really future anymore, because I've already done it. So, not really. It's just Hilbert. Just say thanks, Hilbert, and then carry on with the video. Like, what are you even doing? Like, you're meant to be making a video about the Rastafari, and you're having a conversation with yourself. Yeah, probably a good idea. However, when Jamaica became independent in 1962, oh, I'm great with dates, relations somewhat eased with the Rastafari population inside Jamaica, and actually they were able to forge the Jamaican government with the um, Ethiopian Empire good relations because of the worship of Haile Selassie as the second coming of Christ or the second incarnation of Christ or a prophet of Jah, depending on the interpretation by the Rastafari people in question leading to his state visit to Jamaica in 1966, where tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of people came to watch him land in Kingston, and they surrounded his aircraft and really thought that the Messiah had landed in Jamaica. And actually one of the people in the crowd there, very importantly, was a young girl called Rita Anderson. And although she wasn't a Rastafari when she went, when she came back she was so influenced by having seen Haile Selassie and she said later that she had seen the stigmata, the holes where the nails had punctured through Christ's palms when he was on the cross, on Haile Selassie's hand when he waved at the crowd, so that she went home and told her boyfriend Bob all about it. And of course, this was a huge moment in history, because that Bob was Bob Marley. And his songs, he later converted to Rastafari as well, to that belief set. And many of his songs have, his reggae songs of course, have these very strong lines of Rastafari influence going through them. The song I Am Lion Zion is actually about Haile Selassie himself and his struggle against the Italians. Songs like Buffalo Soldier look at the oppression of various black people throughout history and the story as well as citing the dreadlocked Rasta. One Drop as well reveals things like revelation and redemption and strong uh, associations with the Bible as well as the song War which actually is a what was most of the lyrics were from a speech delivered by Haile Selassie to the UN Council and of course Bob Marley became such a popular reggae star that as well with the Rastafari messages of his music it became a global phenomenon and lots of people flocked to the new religion especially in Jamaica and the African diaspora now another th common thing that's well known about Rastafari is the use of marijuana or cannabis within the group. And actually this is a very important part of the ritual side of the Rastafari movement as they believe that it brings people closer to God, to Jah, but also that it makes people self-reflect more and this they see as a good thing as it's a natural thing. Now at groundings, which are Rastafari ceremonies, essentially lots of people get together um, or a group of people get together and do chanting and drumming and pass around a doobie or a spliff or whatever you want to call it and they smoke the ganja together, which is also the Jamaican term for weed or uh, marijuana. I mean, I know way too many of these terms, but it's a Dutch thing, so I assure you it's all fine. But actually, surprisingly to some, uh, weed isn't actually legal in Jamaica. And this has put them, or any Rastafari, as well as in the diaspora, wherever they are in the world, in conflict with the law and often gives them a bad reputation because they are the ones who are going and smoking marijuana, even when it's illegal, because they claim that it's an important part of their religious practice. Now, actually, many of the Rastafari did actually go over to Africa 
and repatriate as was one of their goals, and even in Ethiopia as Haile Selassie in 1948 actually gave a town Shashamani to the various African people living out in the diaspora and said that they could come and settle there, which many uh, Rastafari people did, mostly from Jamaica but also others from the Caribbean islands and other places in the world. And at one point there were over 2,000 people living in Shishamani who would come there as Rastafaris. However, in 1972 there was a very bad famine in the north of Ethiopia and coupled with a collapse in the price of oil the following year, this led to a lot of social discontentment. Haile Selassie went on national television and announced price freezes so that people would be more in a stable situation, as well as other measures to control the decline in the country, but the flood of aid workers gave the impression that he was no longer in proper control and could do nothing about the plight of the people. But would the restless arm of communism be happy to let the emperor get on with helping his country? No. A Soviet-backed coup of communist-inclined lower-ranking army officers called the Derg actually ousted Haile Selassie in a coup in 1974, starting a period which would see increased famines throughout Ethiopia as well as the imprisonment and execution of tens of thousands of political opposition, including the grandson of Haile Selassie himself. Haile Selassie was not long for the earth and soon after died in imprisonment um, in 1975. He was followed shortly after by Bob Marley in 1981 and the twin deaths of these remembering that Haile Selassie was the man that Rastafaris believed was Jesus Christ come again on earth really shook to the core the um, belief set of the Rastafari if he could be killed on earth then many of them simply refused to believe he was dead and others abandoned the Rastafari belief set all along. Bob Marley on the other hand was not religiously seen as an important figure but culturally he was very important for spreading the message and he was one of the biggest reasons that the Rastafari belief set came to so many people and with his death and the rumours that he had converted to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church on his deathbed, this was also a blow to the Rastafari cause. However, today there are still Rastafari all over the world, mostly concentrated in the African diaspora, as well as, of course, Jamaica, where there are still several tens of thousands, if not more, um, people who, I think hundreds of thousands, um, who are identifying as Rastafari, although they make up only around 1% of the population of Jamaica. Now in Africa as well, of course, Ethiopia, there are still uh, Rastafaris, as well as communities in Kenya, Zimbabwe, Niger, and Ghana that are worth talking about. Now, thank you very much for watching. This has actually been uh, my video on the Rastafari belief set in my sort of philosophy and religion kind of video series. I thought it was something a little bit different, maybe something that you guys don't know too much about because I didn't know too much about it. Um, of course, I've been, if you couldn't tell, I'm a big Bob Marley fan. I've got a poster of his on my wall um, and a t-shirt as well, I think, and two Rasta hats at this stage. I'm not personally a Rastafarian, but it's kind of become a joke with my friends, so uh, they all got me Rasta hats at some point. Um, of course, not meaning to offend anyone, it's all good light-hearted banter. But I thought it would be interesting to make a video about because it is a very interesting belief set. And I hope you have all enjoyed and learned something today. So thank you very much. I'm History with Hill, but if you did enjoy it, give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the bell notification if you have subscribed because I know that there are some issues people have been having with not seeing my videos showing up. And a huge thank you to the patrons, which I'll say properly this time, patron, not Patreon. Patreon's the website, the patron is the person who pays to make you do stuff. Or that's one of them. Anyway, I hope you guys all have a great day.